thank you. Uh, I really appreciate this invitation from the Riyakhtaburi Residency Program and this opportunity to give a lecture and kind of talk about my background as well as some of the questions that are of deep interest to me as a researcher and the curator and writer who is originally from Georgia and based in New York. So I just want to start with um, just a few background no uh, notes. Um, I was born in Georgia in 1982. I uh, came here to the U.S. 20 years ago, and I'm based in New York. Um, my education is from uh, Tbilisi State University, International Relations, um, uh, International Relations and Gender Studies, Bachelor from Mount Holyoke College in the U.S., and currently I'm enrolled in the graduate program Museum Studies at School of Professional Studies, City University of New York. I'm planning to graduate next this coming spring. So um, in terms of kind of my professional approach, I uh, work actively as a writer, uh, as a curator, as well as now I'm, I'm at the gallery. Um, so, hello? Yeah. Uh, so in terms of the, the magazines to, to which, and newspapers to which I have uh, contributed until now, it's Brooklyn Rail Hardware Allergic, Art Newspaper, J Magazine Australia, Neuro Editions, um, Eastern European Film Bulletin, uh, and so forth, um, as well as uh, some published books. So a uh, few of them are centered on the women artists with whom I work continuously, including California-based Anna Valdez, including uh, three Georgian artists, uh, Rustam Fiza and Shuri Tamar Pastadze, and Atwazi Kalashuri, the book about them, King is Female, was published in Berlin 2018. I worked uh, with uh, Daros Lagauri on her catalog uh, back in 2018, and also um, was editor for the Science, Religion, and Culture of Georgia, Concise and Illustrated History, published here in New York in 2017. Um, also, I would like to focus on three selected exhibitions, and over the last seven years, I would say curated over 10 different um, shows in uh, New York, as well as in Germany, in Latvia, and in Georgia. Um, so one of the projects uh, that are important for me to highlight from this year, I was co-curator of online-based uh, fundraiser hosted by Artsy together with uh, Ukrainian Institute of Modern Art. I was co-curator and we invited um, to, so there were over 60 artists, um, roughly half of whom came from Ukraine. And we were able to create this uh, online auction and uh, all in collaboration with that, we were able to raise uh, $358,000 um, that were then distributed um, between the grassroots organization in Ukraine to support the humanitarian efforts there. Uh, in, in terms of the other exhibitions that I would like also to kind of Touch upon uh, 2021. This is not my tree. Was presented. Nurse Foundation featured 14 artists, um, mostly immigrants. I mean, immigrant artists who are based or were based in New York at that point before the pandemic or during the pandemic. Um, so the main idea here was to look at the landscape um, and how we can look at ecosystem as a metaphor for the society. And for example, as immigrants are often compared to some, you know, unfortunately they are compared to invasive species at some point. So uh, looking at this kind of phenomenon, uh, how we look at something that comes to our environment and changes it, and how this could be a stand-in for human experience. And for uh, to kind of to look at this in more detail, I invited 14 artists. Uh, some of them were from Israel, uh, three, uh, two of them were from Georgia, I mean, Tamara Kostad was from Georgia for the specific exhibition, but also Pedro Mesa from Colombia, uh, John Gomez, who is uh, based in New York, uh, and then, you know, um, we had Mohsen Bin Ali, who was from Saudi Arabia, so it was an interesting kind of um, experience to bring all these artists and their immigrant stories in conversation with each other. Uh, another exhibition was uh, Humans and Beings, so the exhibition of Roslan Fivanishuri that I curated at the State Project in Berlin, Germany, 
in 2020. Uh, Rus Sudan is one of, uh, I would say now she's pretty well established also outside of Georgia, uh, but she's a contemporary artist. Um, for me, it's interesting to work with her over the years as uh, she continues to kind of look at her experience within the larger art system and how, um, how for her, this interest in human nature and how, how it changes as society changes um, is of interest to her uh, as well as to me as a curator. Um, in 2019, I curated exhibition as part of my curatorial residence at Kunstraum. Uh, it was titled New York Meets Tbilisi, Defining Otherness. And for this exhibition, I invited eight uh, Georgia-born artists and four American artists in dialogue with each other. It was also kind of, I looked at otherness as it interested me as a theme, uh, because I feel this is a, also a universal phenomenon that um, changes from culture to culture and from society to society based on any given kind of stereotypes within the society. So based on uh, society uh, stereotypes surrounding gender or sexual orientation or immigration. So this was conversation across the border um, between, I would say, mostly emerging artists at that point. Uh, so my current position um, in, in September of this year, actually it was position as senior director at Black Wall Street Gallery in Chelsea. Uh, the idea behind Black Wall Street Gallery originated in Tulsa, Oklahoma with a small artistic space in 2018, in two years moving to New York um, and now expanding to Chelsea to a different location. Uh, the name comes from the historical concentration of black businesses in the Greenwood district of Tulsa, massacred by the local white residents due to hatred and racism on June 1st, 1921. The title of the gallery commemorates this dark moment of the past and continues to work, and where the gallery continues to work bridging racial gaps to present uh, narratives that are largely still um, stereotyped within the, you know, within, the, for example, Chelsea as an art district. So we work with different type of emerging artists um, who, present their own stories and cultures. Uh, another project that was important for me that I worked on last year, uh, and kind of it's, uh, it's a lead on to our topic of this lecture, uh, was looking at Georgian women artists of 20th century. And I created this um, project in a, a collaboration with the Georgian Association in the USA. It was 12 video series, roughly one hour long video series, either including either interviews with the artists, for those who are living, or with the researchers who work with the legacy of this artist. Um, and so there are 12, 12 of them. They're all available on the Georgian Association website as well as on YouTube. And it was important for me to present this work in English as there are really a lack of sources on some of these outstanding artists. And um, I kind of followed chronologically um, and chose 12 artists, but of course this could be expanded and hopefully at some point I will be able to return to this project. And as I was working with the stories and their kind of individual legacies that are really you know, different from each other, but what, what, what is in common with them is this kind of idea of um, how Georgian visual art and of course, society, uh, first the society and then art as embodiment of this, you know, societal narrative um, has dealt with uh, idea of trauma and erasure of culture that was happening in Georgia in 20th century. And I just would like to adhere that, I mean, I'm taking Georgia as a case study. Of course, it's not limited to the country, but I'm just, um, because I know the, the history and the culture of Georgia better than any, probably any other, um, I'm focusing on, on this specific theme for this specific lecture. But of course, it couldn't be limited to just Georgia or to Caucasus or to Ukraine or uh, to Eastern Europe. It's universal, unfortunately, and this is why I feel like this is an important conversation. So, um, and just to start here, it's undiscussed and overlooked topic in the cultural studies of the Caucasus and the post-Soviet space in general. 
a topic that became more and more important as I analyzed the contemporary visual processes in post-Soviet landscape. And for me, uh, as I observe and talk to different artists across the, the board, self-exotization, uh, exotization, when you kind of portray uh, the, the stereotypical sides of Georgia is much easier than really defining uh, your artistic identity. Um, and this is the problem. And I would like to ask you towards the end of this, uh, the slide, what, what do you think about this too? Because it's interesting for me to hear your opinion. Uh, so why this is so hard? What and how? Uh, what could be done to change to address this? So, I mean, one one approach would be academic and visual research uh, to tackle this on many different levels due to the complex nature of this phenomenon. Trauma as a psychosocial concept is one side of the story. A story when read from the side of the press. Um, colonization is the other side of the same story when read, when read from the side of the press of the colonizer of the metropolis. And this is where the universal nature of trauma comes in. Uh, and history of Caucasus um, could be read from both sides. And again, not only the history of Caucasus, but a lot of different types of histories, right? So important place to start here is how we can we define trauma. And for this definition, and I continue to do this research because this is a vast topic and trauma has become more and more kind of catchphrase, especially since the start of the Ukrainian war, it's more and more in the air and the culture of the field. But at the same time, there is uh, this problem with definition because it's so broad and it could be defined in many different ways. So. For us specifically for today, I, I looked at some and I just want to include some here, but um, this is an open-ended process and I don't think we can limit it to just a few examples of defining trauma. But at the same time, it's important to start at least with the definition. Uh, so Bessel van der Kolk, author of uh, Body Keeps the Score, um, this book that I highly recommend reading, although it's not mostly about historical trauma, it's more about individual trauma. But nonetheless, it's a good place to start if you are interested in this topic. Um, as he kind of discusses and uh, showcases uh, war veterans, women with histories of abuse and rape victims, so one of his definitions for trauma is uh, trauma causes people to remain stuck in interpreting the present in the light of the unchanging past. The thing you recreate in a structure may or may not be precisely what happened, but it represents the structure of your inner world that kind of influences your thinking. And if you think about individual, yes, this is about the individual, but also we can extrapolate this to, to a bigger scale, to the scale of a society and history. Another interesting definition that I also find intriguing, excellent book by Griselda Pollock, an art historian, cultural analyst of international post-colonial feminist studies and visual arts. So she kind of uh, speaks about five definitions of trauma, perpetual presentness, permanent absence, representability, belatedness, trans transmissibility, meaning that all of these attributes kind of uh, are part of trauma. Um, and again, for her, she was more of a feminist historian. So she looks at different legacies of uh, feminist activists and feminist writers and uh, artists. But at the same time, it's also, it's much more than this, because if we think about this five elements that are present in any kind of uh, trauma when looked from historical perspective. Another important uh, theorist of trauma, Mariana Hirsch, uh, so in her vast research on memory in the context of Jewish studies and the Holocaust, memory transmission takes place in two distinct ways. Group memory uses family as a mechanism and is intergenerational by nature. National, political, and cultural archival memory is transgenerational as it communicates through symbolic representation. And this is where, um, the idea of institution comes in because for me, as a, for example, as a researcher um, and as, as a student in museum studies, it's important to see how trauma is looked at in institutions. So understandably, institutions mediate the symbolic representation even further for providing their 
own social, political, and cultural context and focus. It is then institutional responsibility to force direct connections to the past, to reactivate and re-embody Buddhist and social, national, and archival cultural memory, memorial structures by reinvesting them with resonant individual familiar forms of mediation and aesthetic expression. And this is excellent um, book and also uh, available as an article in Poetics Today. I would highly encourage you to look into this if you are interested. Uh, so this is kind of one way of looking at it, of what, what, how trauma is transmitted, right? Another, still another definition comes from Derrida for whom Characteristic of trauma is a historical trauma projected in the future. So something that happened and kind of project endlessly towards our uh, future kind of undertakings. So uh, looking at historical intergenerational trauma, where are we uh, as a society, as post-Soviet society? Due to complicated long history of colonialism and post-colonialism in the Caucasus and Eastern Europe, we are yet to come to terms with and define our traumas, but continuous erasure of culture that has been happening in the first Tsarist, then Soviet, and now the post-Soviet historical paradigm is one vintage point that we can take. Uh, so for the purpose of this lecture, I, let's look at a few instances of this erasure when it comes to the visual arts. Um, and of course, I would like to start the Stalin's definition of culture according to his 1930 article on the question of nationality, national culture. As he emphasized the need for culture that should retain minimal nationalist feature while serving the socialist ideology. Uh, and I mean, uh, Mikhail Khmelko's uh, triumph of the victorious mother motherland, this uh, Canoe of patriotism and the, you know that portrays uh, the Red Square and kind of the triumph of, over the Nazi Germany is kind of one uh, one good point to kind of bring it into perspective that this is the country that really put this ideology at the very center of its core and this is something that we probably uh, not remember all that well because we are more and more removed from from this past on the one hand on the other hand. And I would love to hear more from you about this. Uh, there is this kind of sense, at least in the West, that Russia is actually, in a way, is going back to that same ideological, uh, isolated position. So, but just to go back um, to this uh, to this question. So, the, to create this new socialist culture, the new Soviet regime hijacked the new trends within existing visual arts, such as futurism, poetics of revolution, transformation, translated into it ideological messages. And this is where the erasure of national and ethnical cultures kind of started to, to be prevalent. For example, we have Iriak Letoidze, who is one of outstanding Soviet uh, Georgian artists. But as you can see here, this is, I mean, you would probably recognize this two important posters from 1941, 1945 that he created. Although he indeed was Georgian and very patriotic, but this was something that he he was um, expected to do. At the same time, we have his two illustrations to Bakhtrioni, uh, the uh, enigmatic poem by Vajab Shavela, that talks a lot about uh, you know um, nationalistic kind of uprising within uh, Caucasus Mounting. But at the same time, we have his Joseph Stalin reading Night in the Panther Skin which is uh, the, the poem that's, uh, you know, uh, symbolic for any Georgian. So this was something that has been created at this time, 1930s, 1940s, this blending culture, the kind of <clears throat> losing, uh, losing the ethnic and more uh, nationalistic um, deeper structures of nationality while just keeping this as a form, right? Because it, it's more of uh, along the, the outside features rather than deeper meaning within this. Uh, for me here, it's important to kind of uh, remember Louis Mountford's definition uh, from his 1967 book, Myth of the Machine. And I think that um, his definition of totalitarianism is very up to the point. This was an invisible structure composed of living but rigid human parts, each assigned to his special office role and task to make possible the immense work output and grand design of this great collective organization, which was part of the whole idea behind the Soviet 
uh, machine. Uh, then I would like to kind of bring this um, couple of illustrations. And I, I apologize for the quality of this image. I feel like it's really uh, compressed. Uh, Apollon Kutatsalad's the plantation, his uh, important work, which is really beautiful in its own right when you go to, to Tbilisi, uh, to the museum uh, on Rustavali Street and you see it in person. It has all this quality of, you know, of Jove de Vivre, of, you know, of, uh, uh, joy to to be part of this you know this outstanding joyous society and be part of, uh, work as as a as a part of this machine but at the same time we we see uh that this is all kind of tied to what was prescribed by the official socialist uh, realism and what needed to be done by artists otherwise they would have been in uh, in physical danger, but nonetheless, uh, in contrast to this conformism, there is an outstanding uh, kind of legacy of non-conformist art, and non-conformist art has uh, resonantly developed throughout the Soviet Union in opposition to the totalitarian machine. And just last week, uh, when I was kind of really thinking about this lecture, I was able to. Uh, visit outstanding exhibition locating Georgia's selections from the Northern Nancy Deutsch collection of non-conformist art from the Soviet Union, currently on view at the Zimmerle Museum at uh, Rutgers University, um, co-curated by Sopo, Gagoshid, and Jane Sharp. Um, and this was very interesting exhibition for me to visit because it brought together many different artists um, from this non-conformist uh, background who, who devoted their whole life to kind of fighting against the, the system, the Soviet system. And I just wanted to, I could include, I could have included more works, but I just wanted to include this, uh, these two works for our purposes. So one is the K. Parajanos untitled collage on the idea of spirituality. And, you know, of course, uh, Parajanov was lar larger than life figure who really resisted the Soviet system and who fell victim to it many times, including his imprisonment for his sexual orientation, right? Uh, and, but nonetheless, he was able to create his outstanding uh, feature films that really, even after all these years, stand the test of time, but it's outstanding imagination and legacy. And then we have Otar Khartishvili here as well. I, I found this work very poignant um, because it brings this, you know, um, for Georgia, the, the Christian faith is one of the um, you know, defining characteristics and how he was kind of, he, he brought together this icon, empty icon on top of the, the Soviet symbology. Um, and importantly, I, I didn't realize it until yesterday, but Otar Khartishvili was actually the student of Apollon Kutateladze, whose work I just show you, showed you um, with the tea plantation here. So this was his student, who nonetheless was very active as non-conformist, who has been part of the so-called the bulldozer exhibition in 1974 in Moscow, and who had the real uh, big issues with the Soviet system and you know, actively was fighting it. So nonetheless, there were artists present who were resisting the machine, resisting the Soviet system, resisting this erasure of culture in its own, in their own artistic ways. So this is to look at the past, but uh, where does this leave us now, for example? I would say that we're still at historical crossroads, and unfortunately for Georgia and for, for Ukraine, and this is where my part of Ukrainian kind of part of this lecture comes in. Uh, so in a way, we have been at this crossroads for many, many years, for, for since pretty much um, the last, 2014 probably is the, the device of line here. And what has started in Ukraine, it seems that it's going more and more towards different countries within the region. So it's interesting and it's kind of important to see where we are it's a, from an objective perspective. Um, and so I presented, I, like, I would like to kind of um, uh, continue the conversation about the ratio of culture, bringing in the Ukrainian piece here and being half Ukrainian myself from my mother 
uh, this is a part of my identity that I will have always been in touch, but even more so since the beginning of the war, because I felt really strongly about this. Uh, so, and I, I'm trying to highlight it through different articles, publications, and conversations. And, you know, just because I feel this is important time that we shouldn't uh, let it slide by uh, as it happened before. So, um, erasure of culture then. So, how is it happening? So, importantly for, uh, for the Caucasus, as well as for, for Europe and Eastern Europe in general, um, of course, language and education and academic education has always been at the forefront of uh, any national identity building, right? So deliberate targeting of schools and cultural institutions continue today in Ukraine. In the time of writing since the start of the war, the country has lost over 154 cultural sites, including seven libraries, 16 monuments, 30 historic buildings, 12 museums, 70 religious sites, 19 buildings dedicated to cultural activities. I would say that number is much higher now since this has been written um, a few months ago, unfortunately. So then another piece of cultural erasure that I found really striking as I started to look in more detail about this um, was uh, the, the idea that some of the artists of Ukrainian descent and also of Georgian descent as well, uh, were portrayed as uh, representatives of the Russian art when they're sold at Sotheby's. So, for example, Kazimir Malevich is one example, who was born in Kiev to Polish parents and spent his childhood in Kiev until moving to Kursk and then to Moscow in 19, uh, 1904, returning to Kiev Art Institute in 1929, when he was subsequently banned from exhibiting in Russia. He's best known as the creator of the Black Square Supremacist Masterpiece celebrating a new proto-conceptual approach to color. While his lesser known scenes reflect his Ukrainian heritage. Nevertheless, um, Russian propaganda clearly mandates that Malevich was a Russian artist proudly displaying him on culture.ru por portal as part of the Russian legacy. This has even slipped into the West when he was included 2022 Russian uh, picture sales at Sotheby's. And similar thing happened to Pirosmani, Nico Pirosmani, who is an iconic Georgian artist, who is also sometimes presented as part of the Russian sales, uh, as Russian picture sales at Sotheby's, which is, um, when you think about it, what it does to the cultural identity, it's, it's hard to underestimate it. Uh, but nonetheless, there are some efforts to fight against this. Um, a group of Ukrainian students titled Shadow Project is currently fighting this injustice and Russian propaganda by consistently posting about Ukrainian artists and their ties to the country. By taking a proactive stand, the Ukrainian community worldwide has achieved concrete results, for example, changing title of Edgar Degas' Russian dancers to Ukrainian dancers in the National Gallery in London. Let's hope that Malevich and David Burluk or Alexander Bogomaza will be next. And this is an example of Edgar Degas that was previously titled as Russian dances, but this is um, titled Ukrainian dances now. Uh, another kind of aspect of this um, that I erasure, cultural erasure in general, that I find very problematic is the idea of New East, uh, the concept coming from some of the Western media outlets. Uh, that to me, and I would love to hear more from you since you work a lot with media and with different types of publication, but this uh, idea of unifying all of the, you know, all, of all the post-Soviet spaces in this new East is really uh, a way of erasing the national features as well. So, for example, <laughs> this this comes from um, one of the publications, but it, this is just one image. But at the same time, I'm sure you have observed this false unification as an attempt to equate the context of region to one visibly recognizable mix of brutalist Soviet architecture and old posters, brush colors, and exo exoticized fascination with you know faraway lands legends fashion all of this is blended all of this on the background of the brutalist soviet architecture and this is something that to me um also rings the bell of this uh new revamped colonial perspective upon all of this for soviet spaces so i mean this was 
pretty much the end of my slides, but I would like to ask you some questions and I would like to kind of continue this maybe in a more kind of discursive way. I, I, first of all, I would like to ask if you have any questions for me, but then I would like to hear uh, what you think about, like, for example, these three questions. Uh, okay, let me just stop sharing here. Yeah, but I'll have this here. Yes. So much, Nina. I have one question. Uh, from the very beginning, you started to uh, show some of your project, and uh, they were focused on uh, dialogue, dialogue uh, between Georgian artists and American artists, uh, showing some uh, Georgian artists mm -hmm. in other spaces. So, like. Do you recognize yourself as a curator positioning more with Georgian art or international art or how it for you? What, what's your interest nowadays? Yes, Oksana, thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, for the question. Well, first of all, this was in 2019. And at that point, I was kind of, my main focus, I would say, was presenting Georgian artists specifically for this curatorial residency, as this was my focus for this residency, because that um, exhibition was accompanied by an essay that, uh, in, uh, that discussed the contemporary Georgian art. So it was important for me to present Georgian artists as part of this. But I would say that uh, I position myself as presenting interesting and you know notable artists coming from eastern europe i wouldn't say that i limit myself to just georgian artists but for me it's i i understand georgian culture probably again better than some others but i always try to present eastern european narratives i would say i, I wouldn't say i limit myself just to georgian artists at this point because one reason why uh, I, I would say it's broader now for me, because I realized over time really how few curators in the West do this. They're just, even in New York, you would think there, there would be much, many more, uh, you know, researchers and curators and writers who work with this really amazingly rich legacy and culture and history, but there are not so many. So... I would say just limiting myself to presenting Georgian artists uh, is not uh, kind of, it loses its point. Although it's, it's a home base for me in a way. Yeah, thank you, got it. And also one more question uh, through your works. Uh, it was listed about uh, Darosa Salakawuri. We know her works and she is our good colleague and friend. And uh, mm -hmm. did you do you write a curatorial text to her or it was about yeah. editing or no, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, she had an exhibition in twenty when was twenty eighteen. Uh yes, at, uh, at then there was there existed gallery at now it doesn't exist anymore. There was a solo show for which I wrote uh for the catalogue. I wrote the they say together with Uta Grosenik based from Germany. So we wrote uh, the two of us this curatorial essay for the catalog. Now, I believe that I would have still have it. I don't have it in digital format, unfortunately. I have a couple of physical copies left. Thank you. And, and one more question, but it's not uh, the question uh, to answer it. It just uh, uh, the scenes that I'm interested the more about this exotization and how mm -hmm. to present uh, New East or uh, post, uh, right. um, like yes, so, uh, this Eastern was Europe something, countries. Yeah, I, would love yeah. to, I would love to hear from you and from others as well, because this is the question that I ask myself a lot when I look at different materials, but a lot from what comes from, from uh, again, Eastern Europe is a very big, place right um but i don't want to limit it just a few countries just by naming a few countries so i'm just curious do you feel like there exists this type of new east and do you feel that there exists demand of images of certain images from this new east since you work with media uh, i believe that there is a 
some special interest uh, in the area, uh, which uh, used to be called uh, post-Soviet countries. And now, like geographically, it started to call uh, New East. Why it's so, uh, I don't know. So, like, I don't have an answer for this. Uh, but um, uniting all those countries, of course, we have uh, lots of historical background uh, in this area, uh, but at mm -hmm. the same time, uh, there are so many different uh, nuances and uh, details in each culture, so that it could be in both ways. Right. And this is where it seems that, you know, when you unify something as large as the post-Soviet space, right, under one name, you are bound to, to get to this uh, again, the sometime, some type of stereotyping about the specific location rather than when you look at different kind of countries and national histories. And this is kind of also a erasure of culture in a way that that's um, more digestible. You know, it happens for, for the sake of clarity and for the sake of ease. When you put everything into one category, oh, now this is New East, right? This used to be Soviet Union, now it's New East, right? So in a way, it, it's just easier to understand when you don't, don't um, no, when you are not grounded in the history and the context. And this is going back to your question of where I position myself. I position myself just in a way of really presenting different narratives and bringing in different stories rather than one story of New East. Because for me, it's much more, much more, multifaceted than this one place, you know? Uh, I'm curious to hear uh, Daniel or Teona, you also, I mean, you know the region. So I'm just curious, in I have, so, um, what do you think in terms of erasure of culture? Do you think it's actually happening that you are observing it anywhere as of now? I mean, I think it's more of a misunderstanding. I think this is something that has to be like, uh, discussed. Uh, it's it's just, uh, I think there was no such a thing in Georgia to study the colonialism and uh, the approach to it, especially uh, the term of like Russian colonial, it is something that uh, emerged recently. Uh, so uh, also like talking about the erasure of the culture, it's also very new in the context of uh, this society that I've, I'm living in now, like in Georgia overall, because I have a more of a different perspective because I'm like, I immigrated twice, I was raised in Moscow. So I have a different perspective of all, all observing from a side of what's happening inside the country, I mean, Georgia. So uh, in this terms of how I've learned uh, what's happening inside Russia, particularly like, what I've experienced. And then when I came here and how it's all like approach to the culture is very different. So I would say that at least for me, there is more understanding from the side of uh, immigrants, uh, of Georgian immigrants, of what is Georgian culture more rather than of those who live inside the country. So the awareness of it, actually the historical awareness of uh, what happened to the historical monument. So I think the understanding of it is more like uh, spread uh, among the uh, migrant society of the Georgian migrant society rather than local Georgians who grew up within the country. Because I think the less of a propaganda actually that was inside the country affected the mind in a way. And I think uh, right. outside it to really observe it. So I think yeah. it's, it's an excellent point. I, I, uh, yeah, thank you. That's an excellent point that I kind of really also tend to under underestimate. Because there's also yeah, this, uh, I just, uh, this is what I experienced myself, uh, like several times in, in terms of also like speaking the language because I've learned Georgian at home. Uh, so, uh, and uh, like uh, there is a notion within this society in Georgia that those who come from abroad, they don't really have an awareness of culture or the understanding of language. So there is more like this labeling of something that is already foreign. It's more like this Soviet approach of something that is different, that comes outside, that they think that it's already an enemy. So 
I think uh, this is something that stays within the mind of these like post-Soviet countries. It's not only about Georgia, honestly, but this is something I experienced personally. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah um, within the mind of even the generation, like my generation, which hasn't really lived in Soviet times. Uh, but this is something comes from their parents and it's also like lays uh, this layer within those people, like younger people who think that something foreign even something foreign that uh, culturally, like, uh, I mean, me, like culturally kind of attached to them because I'm origin Georgian, uh, it's not acceptable. So uh, yeah, there is this kind of uh, like misleading aspect within the mindset. I would say that I have all the time like to struggle with, but I kind of accept it. So um, it's more of a like, yeah, this, this more like an approach way of uh, talking also. So yeah, this might just generally like my opinion over- No, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, please. Yeah, but it's it's all like depends on like, it's all my personal experience. So I just, um, just or maybe somebody has a different experience. I'm just like overall like saying, uh, I don't want to like generalize it, but it's more overall like this uh, opinion on something that I, observe from my side so right no and, and in general I, I what you mentioned before and i believe i had a couple of short conversations over instagram on this that this idea of colonization kind of looking at the legacy of colonization in relation to, to georgia for example or the caucasus um it hasn't been really looked into at all and this is something that needs to be done from you know, younger generation from researchers who are on the ground, you know, going toward archives and really studying this and kind of um, bringing in academic dimension of it. So, um, yeah, this is kind of important conversation that in a way, uh, as you know, there is the saying, we are not, we are bound to repeat what we don't understand. And if we don't understand this, and we, if we don't resolve this traumas and this kind of uh, yeah, there's know, no uh, like, uh, there's not much awareness of it, and it's not only about. I mean, it's not only about the Russian colonial. It, it was also like in terms of uh, Osman Empire, in terms of Persian Empire. So, considering all of this, it it was not approached as a colonial. Uh, I mean, it wasn't as a colonial approach within also studying the history in Georgia. So it doesn't really have it. Uh, right, like. Um, and uh, this is something that is not really taught in the institution, unfortunately, and how uh, it also affected the culture and overall the regions. Uh, so, yeah, I think uh, this is something that's a big uh, well within our society, like a big hole in a way that, uh, right. uh, yeah, just uh, I think it's more like creates this bubble of misinformation. Misinformation as well as double standards and this kind of double truth that we know is, is pretty substantial in Georgia because some topics are just not really discussed all that openly. And unfortunately that happens in many crucial areas, but let's hope that with kind of new generation, new blood, new conversations, um, it will become more and more, uh, you know, possible. And for, for this, this type of programs, like your program, like your residency program, or inviting, you know, um, scholars from the West to kind of be looking into this, supporting them, uh, this, this needs to be part of this conversation as well. Yeah. Um, yes, Daniel, uh, please go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, 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 there was many new facts that I didn't know about uh, before, uh, and uh, I think I, I'm not uh, really deep uh, in this theme about uh, uh, Georgian col uh, colonial uh, history and. Uh, uh, I, I think I need to learn uh, many things from uh, some people like you and Tirone and some from Georgian Nazis, but uh, I think that uh, unfortunately 
uh, I am like a part of some Russian people. I understand that Russian people and uh, Russian generation is a victim of this history of imperialism too, because now uh, Russian identity is, uh, I don't know how it disappeared. And uh, now uh, I think uh, we, we have this history of trauma uh all uh all people from ussr and now we can use it like tools that we have uh, many uh things uh, many uh, trauma things that we know all everybody and uh, we can use it like tools to communicate and to uh, teach each other and to learn from each other uh, how to escape from this trauma and from this experience and how to, uh, how to, I don't know, <laughs> uh, it's difficult to make, uh, for me to say everything that I uh, have in my uh, head, but yeah, uh, I think we, we should uh, communicate uh, and to learn uh, uh, from each other, uh, uh, as an artist uh, experience uh, what uh, this uh, experience of uh, trauma imperialism trauma of Soviet Union means for everybody for uh, right. Georgian people for Ukrainian people only after these many dialogues between uh, us as a part of this big uh, disaster we can go uh, through it and go uh, in, in the future i think uh, uh, of course independent but uh, uh, but in conversation in dialogues right no uh, then i think you raised great points and it's also it's, it's a larger conversation again as i started um it's not only about georgia i mean i'm highlighting georgia and i highlighted some of the last half facts from the Ukrainian kind of past, recent past, unfortunately. Uh, but it, it's definitely, it's a larger conversation that includes many different nations, right, of the post-Soviet countries. But also this idea of uh, what you were saying before, that these conversations were not uh, something that happened after the Soviet collapse, that led in a way to, to what's happening in, in uh, with Russian nationalism right now, right? Because they were never like, in, if you compare it to, to the fall of Nazi regime in Germany, right? That also had many victims. What happened there with Nuremberg trials and people really being held accountable for what they did that never happened after the Soviet Union. Yes, there were people of course, like uh, that were executed first by Stalin and then after him, but it was never to the point of really uh, asking questions of what led to this, of who was accountable for their actions. That was not the case. And when this type of dialogue within the society doesn't happen, the change doesn't really, it's not there. It, it, it might be like individually, people might get to those ideas, but it's not the larger open-ended discussion. And it never happened in Georgia. And I don't think, I mean, you probably know this memorial, right? Organization, the memorial, well, that worked a lot with the legacy of the Soviet repression, for example. But it was never. It, it now it's closed. They like the, the the it was closed earlier this year after all the twenty years of really outstanding work of looking into this. So, in a way, these are really um, difficult but important conversations that that can, in a way, kind of. Um, work against this, this happening again now, right? But thank you for the excellent point. And I feel like this is your role as, as artists, as journalists, as writers, to to kind of, to forge this discussion, to look into detail and, you know, to touch people. Because academically, it's one thing, you like this type of conversation is one thing, but when, when you are able to influence people directly through your art, it, it gives it a different dimension. This is why it's interesting to look at this from the perspective of contemporary art or institution, to me, for example. Um, thank you, Nina, and thanks, uh, Daniel. I, I wanted to follow up this question uh, with uh, 
the another one uh, about this erasing and uh, in, uh, culture, the raising memory, and uh, not uh, be available to speak about trauma just now and uh, about many things. For instance, uh, like during the Soviet time, it was forbidden to, of course, to talk about those uh, cleansing, ethnical cleansing, about uh, Stalin right. repressions, about uh, different things that memorial, of course, uh, witnessing and not witnessing, but documenting and uh, uh, bringing right. to the light. And nowadays, uh, uh, do you like how it is on the other um, side of the ocean from your point of view do you uh, see that uh, people avoid uh, to speak about uh, what's going on right now like avoiding this uh, even this um, um, word dialogue like let's not start this dialogue right now let's let's wait until the war is over let's wait uh, like till something till uh, some point when it's possible because uh, we feel that uh, uh, now this like i showed you the project yesterday i said that about russian ukrainian couples and for me it was also a very big question is it uh, <laughs> Um, uh, able to work on it now but uh, then I answer uh, to myself on this question and I also like still have lots of questions concerning what should we do now in terms of what's happening uh, in terms of what our own uh, common history and uh, erasing culture in, in the past and erasing culture now as well. Right. So I mean in terms of the dialogue uh... One thing that definitely brought, unfortunately, this um, the, the Ukrainian the invasion of Ukraine brought to uh, to the West is is a kind of people like general public more understanding and more interested to learning more about the the, the region and the context of of what was happening and what is happening, and in a way you really don't understand what's happening now if you don't understand what happened in 2014 with Maidan, with the Donbass, right? Without this history, you don't really have that. Um, so in a way, you know, people would like to, to learn more and they're wanting to learn more. The dialogue um, that you're referring to, the dialogue with Russia, I don't think it's really in anyone's mind at all because it's even more so... Um, it's even has become more aggressive this over time and over this year, right? Obviously, um, the aggression is felt here as well. And, you know, it's um, general public is not really interested in learning more about this. Uh, but at the same time, again, it's our responsibility to kind of to foster this conversation and to foster the stories and to bring them forward in any medium that... Um, that we can, you know, through through different projects and through different interviews and articles. This is what I've been trying to to do on my end. But the story, of course, even even in the, you know, even when you know the story, uh, you know how difficult it is to kind of to paint everything with, with the black and white. Uh, because even, you know, there are so many people in Ukraine who grew up with both languages, right, with Russian and Ukrainian parents, or, uh, so this is not as black as and white uh, when you, as when when you are born here and you're looking from uh, from the U.S. to, to, to Ukraine and to Russia. So it's a, it's a story for us, and it's our responsibility to try to, to show as many dimensions of it to the West as we can. That would be probably my preliminary answer to that. Thank you. No. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. So, Teona, uh, please guide us um, to the next step. What are it's like eleven right now? Well, next is a studio visit with Daniel, but we can do a small break if you guys want, and then we can start with Daniel's presentation. And he will talk uh, about yeah. his recent uh, the, project for the, the residency. And okay. yeah, well, I think everybody can actually to be honest, in open. I'm so, uh, yeah. 
I'm sorry, Tiona. If to be, if to be honest, uh, I really wanted to be in my time because okay. I wanted to add something to my presentation and maybe to have a dinner because I didn't eat today. <laughs> Uh, uh, so if it, if it is possible, I I will keep I would keep my time, uh, or or I can change with Peter if it is more comfortable for Nina, uh, and we can yeah, choose is, another way with for Peter with Peter. Yeah, because Peter uh, he's he's supposed to be like at eight. I'm just saying that because we won't be able to start now. Just if you want to, if we need to have a break, we can start later maybe. Let's say, like, we can start at nine if it's convenient. In one hour, okay. so now? Yeah, so if okay. it's like, would be convenient for you and then we can just, um, Okay. Yeah, okay, no, one hour is fine. Thank you so much. Sure. No, I can. I can. I will be back in one hour. Uh, Aksana and Elena, thank you for joining. And please stay in touch. I would really love to hear more about your project. So. Yeah, we can. Nina, it was very, very interesting and yeah, very useful. And um, can I also follow up with a question? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, when you speak uh, or when you try to. Uh, restructure maybe the stories about Georgia and Georgian heritage. Do you think that Asian uh, narratives are equally maybe important as uh, the Western context? Because uh, I know that uh, so like the larger uh, stories, yeah. Mm, and, no, of um, course. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I feel like definitely this is something that also needs to be addressed within the Russia, within I'm sorry, within Georgian history, because we definitely had a, a you know long term invasion by Mongols and uh, Turks, and this is also part of our history, just as much as as anything else that that came later on. Uh, and at the same time, though, um, I always feel that when you talk about the specific invasion from, from the East to Georgia, in, in that space, um, religion was a very unifying force for Georgians. Uh, and just the fact that mostly um, these invasions came with their own religion, with Muslim, you know, with, uh, with the faith that was trying to be being implanted into Georgia. Um, this idea of uh, nationalism that focused with the, within the, Christ, the Orthodox Christianity was very strong uh, as a focus point against this invasion, which didn't happen as much uh, in 20th century, obviously, because there were many, many different layers of the erasure that um, that was coming in. But um, but at the same time, this is also something that needs to be you know, researched really and looked more into. So in a, in a way, I look at my investigations, it's like, <clears throat> yes, I'm doing the best I can as a research from, from the outside of Georgia at the time being, but <clears throat> I really hope that this is a starting point for this type of research that is really needed for the country to really understand and be honest about the processes that have been taking place uh, over centuries. So, um, but this is, important factor. I agree with you. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, um, it was really a pleasure to meet uh, with you all, you know, um, to share some opinions. And please stay in touch. Uh, I think Kona has my, my email. So yeah, it would be lovely to stay in touch with all of you. And then, um, you know, I will see I will you share, in one hour. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll just, uh, yeah, at nine. So, okay, thank you. Thank you and uh, see you soon. Thank okay. you. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.